So hi folks, Alex Woods here, Civil Litigator. This is a vlog that I've been promising to do for some time. It's obviously particularly important, relating as it does to an essential part of the statements of case in a claim. So I'm going to actually spend a little bit of time not only just going through the general points, but I'm actually also halfway through the vlog going to go into some detail and actually put up a couple of sample examples of defences. Uh, I should just say, if you want to know how to approach us, if you're interested in us helping you, we do provide a small claims advice and assistance service. These vlogs have helped you if you're a litigant in person. If you are interested in approaching us for legal advice and assistance, we offer a small claims track uh, service, and it's a discounted rate of £150 plus fat. Uh, but um, you can learn more about that if you go to the end of the video. So to come on to the defence, I think the most important thing to uh, appreciate, and this is true of particulars of claim as well, is a statement of case is meant to be concise uh, and it's meant to you know, flesh out and address the issues. And that is its job. Its job is not for you to tell the court about everything, about all the evidential issues. It's not a case of putting forward any evidence whatsoever. Evidence is dealt with by means of witness statements and that comes down the track, whether it's on a small claim or whether it's a fast track. So don't be confusing evidence. We're simply laying out the bare bones, the skeleton of your case, the facts of the story of the case. And what is true of the particulars of claim is also equally true of the defence. Now, just a, a general thing, let's say you've unexpectedly got a particulars of claim form slap onto your doormat and to your great astonishment, and you've not got any pre-action letter or pre-action letter of claim left for action from your opponent. You're kind of wondering, well, hang on, surely, and you'll be absolutely right here, the system is set up. Ever since Lord Wolfe invented the, the new system, the new regime that we're now under in 1999, the idea is that you try and settle disputes without going to court. So if you get a claim form unexpectedly out of the blue, that it's important to note that. And I would include a paragraph in your defence, uh, just dealing with pre-action. And perhaps even, I do this sometimes in bigger claims, put you know a, a, a section heading, pre-action, paragraph 9, blah, 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 pre-action, paragraph 10 and then actually address the fact that your opponent hasn't complied with the pre-action protocols and you don't, you, you've been given no notice of the claim that's arrived unexpectedly. That will then help you. Uh, a lot of civil litigation is about kind of laying little mines that you can put in the ground and blow up later. Because when you get into court, even if you lose, the judge may make a cost order against your opponent. And remember, although small claims is meant not to uh, have costs, certainly legal costs, uh, incurred by a losing side. The judge has absolute discretion on costs, yeah? And if conduct of your opponent has been unreasonable, then the judge can make a cost order. So that deals with the pre-action. Now, you've, you've got this claim pack land on your doorstep. The court will have uh, served you, uh, and there will be at the top an issue. Top right, there'll be an issue date. That's a very important date and you'll have the claim form, and then you'll either have the particulars of claim just in the front box or in one of the later boxes all laid out, uh, or you may have a full set of particulars of claim. Solicitors drafting, barristers drafting particulars of claim tend to create separate documents which then get attached to the claim form itself. Okay, so you've then got a, a, a choice, really. The first thing to, to the first choice that you have to make is how quickly you need to respond to this claim. You have got a 14 days, yeah. But if you fill in that little acknowledgement of service section, which will be in the claim pack, uh, you get an extra 14 days. That gives you 28 days from the date of issue to file and serve, you should always serve your opponent as well as filing doc documents of the court, your defence. You can then actually uh, admit the 
the claim. Now, you may be part admitting that you may want to part admit the claim. For example, I had a claim recently where my client borrowed some money, sixty thousand pounds, but our opponent uh, and he accepted that he borrowed the money, but our opponent had slapped on compound interest, which took the claim value to nearly a hundred thousand or above. Actually, uh, now that is some uh, situation in which you part admit the claim. You may be fully admitting the claim, and that's where you'll see that you've got a uh, personal cir financial circumstances form, right? So you can, that's if you're hard up, you really can't afford to pay, then you complete that personal financial circumstances form. The, the claimants out there, it's quite difficult to get money out of a defendant if they claim that they haven't got it. Uh, and I mean, I've got a claim recently where client lent, lent £5,000 and she's got away with £300 a month for a payment plan and she actually appealed the payment plan and wants to reduce it to £50. Unless you've got strong evidence that she's got you know, a Lamborghini sitting in the drive, that she's got, you've got details of her bank account or, or that you know and you can prove that she's paying a salary, it could be a waste of time going back to court in order to try and get your opponent to pay a lump sum. So if you're a defendant, that's worth knowing. If you are a little bit hard for cash, you're, a, a court will probably, what's the word, rubber stamp a request for a, repay, a reasonable repayment plan. Then of course you've got the section, this is what we're dealing with principally in this vlog, of where you say, no, I'm defending the claim and here is my defence, okay? I should just explain that if you need longer than 28 days. The civil procedure rules, the CPR, which is the Bible for uh, for procedure in the county court system of England and Wales, you can actually ask for an extension of another 28 days, so a total of 56 days. You, so if you need it, it's a complex claim, you've had problems with documentation, or you've found it difficult to find the right lawyer, whatever, it, or the lawyer's been slow, whatever it is, you can request an extension to 56 days and that is yeah, something that your opponent really should object to. I very rarely, if a solicitor in litigation asks me for a 28 day extension, I very rarely refuse them. Why? What happens if you <coughs> refuse? They just make an application to court and the judge, you go to court, your opponent goes to court, the judge looks you in the eye and says, Mr Woods, is it really such a big deal to have an extra 28 days? Are you hugely prejudiced? Is your client terribly prejudiced by an extra 28 days? And you, you kind of look down at your tie and you go, well, you want to no. Well, then this has all been a waste of time. So I'm ordering costs against you of this hearing. So, uh, you know, unless there's a very good reason, don't, don't object if you're a claimant to, um, and if you're a defendant, rest assured, you know, Courts are flexible about these matters. Courts take forever to do anything anyway. <coughs> They're probably worse than you are in terms of keeping, keeping, to, <laughs> keeping, to, the, to, keeping to deadlines and managing paperwork. Um, I shouldn't have said that many judges are, uh, are watching these vlogs. But the court system is underfunded and they will be reasonable where a, litigation, a litigant in person is concerned in terms of giving you proper and ample time to make sure that you've produced a proper defence. I had a client room me up yesterday actually, so I'm on the way to the post office, I want an hour's work, I was on my day off, I picked up the call fortunately, uh, the email fortunately from my uh, paralegal assistant, I phoned him, but I rather fear at the end of the day yesterday, but I rather fear he's actually going to the post office and posted his defence. He's got until, he's actually got another week, but he was obviously very anxious to get the defence off. No, don't hurry, get it right. If you get statements of case wrong, you've got that risks of strike out applications and you've got risks of having to make an application to amend your defence or your particulars of claim which you will have to bear the costs of and the other side instruct expensive lawyers you could be on the wrong end of a two grand bill just because you didn't get it right at the very beginning okay so now a defence, what does it comprise? Well, it, 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 it's simpler than the particulars of claim because you know you have the particulars of claim to work with, don't you? What you do is you simply address each and every allegation in the particulars of claim in the order in which they appear, chronological order almost certainly, and you either, uh, well, uh, not either, because you do one of three things, you 
admit the allegation, yeah, you deny the allegation, or there's a further option which is you require the claimant to prove the allegation. You neither admit it nor do you deny it. So those are the three things that you, uh, those are the three ways that you should just simply, with a razor sharp, focused mind, being concise, go through the allegations in the particulars of the claim and do one of those three things. If you don't, then the court will take it that you're admitting it. Unless it's obvious because you've put your side of the story, if, if you've put your side of the story in it, 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 it obviously can contradicts what the particulars of claim say, what the claimant says, then in those circumstances the court will assume that you actually do deny it. But be careful therefore not to miss things. Yeah? That's why it's important to be razor sharp focused and address every and each and every allegation in the particulars of claim. Okay, uh, what in what circumstances might you sort of require your opponent to prove something? Well, take for example, let's say it's a person injury claim and the person is off work for you know six months and they say they're a high paying banker at five hundred thousand pounds a year. You're not going to call them a liar and deny that, are you? Nor are you going to want to admit that. You are going to want to put them to proof, i.e., they produce evidence that they are entitled to six months worth. Uh, of lost work at five hundred thousand pounds a year. Okay, so those are the sorts of things that you that you used in order to put someone to um, to strict proof. Uh, there are just a couple of other things that <coughs> I should also mention. One is that uh, you may want to what's called plead because when you draft the statement of case, the verb is your pleading. Uh, you may want to put something in the alternative. So, for example, you may want to say, I deny that, uh, you know, I, I deny that I uh, wrongly, let's say you're a tradesman, you're a plumber, and you've installed uh, a shower unit, and uh, let's say you are... Um, bringing, a, let's say, the consumer is bringing a claim against you for water damage to the floor of their apartment because the shower unit leaked after the works, okay. Uh, you might defend that by saying, I deny that I negligently fitted the shower unit. Uh, you might then say, in the alternative, if which is denied, it it is proved that the shower unit was negligent, negligently fitted. We say the fact that the uh, customer used the shower when, under, uh, when they were under strict instructions by us not to during the works, that uh, significantly contributed to the problem and it was actually that that caused the water damage to the floor. So you're, what you're doing there is you're pleading in the alternative. You're kind of saying, if the court finds against me on that point, nevertheless, there's this extra point or hurdle that they're going to have to overcome. So that's uh, what pleading in the alternative means. There's another issue, another area, which is duty to <coughs> mitigate. So once again, using that example of the boiler man, uh, sorry, the uh, plumber or the shower fitter, he uh, is defending the claim brought by the consumer for damage done to the floor as a result of a leak. Um, and he might say something like, in an extra paragraph, and maybe he could give a little bit of a heading due to the mitigate if it's an important part of his case. Uh, you know, although if it is, if it is proved that uh, we were negligent, uh, the claimant is actually responsible for damage to the floor because they didn't take action to clean up the water after the works were completed. In fact, it took them four weeks because they were away on a holiday before they actually addressed the problem, even though it had been brought to their attention or, or, or whatever it is. 
and, and you could say that the uh, claimant is therefore under was under a duty to mitigate their loss and should have got someone in to at least mop up the water and so you're implying therefore that the real damage was caused by in a way their negligence rather than yours and so it's a duty to mitigate their losses if a claimant brings a claim against a defendant and the defendant says that uh, the you know defendant could if they'd acted reasonably prevented the actual financial loss which is in this case having to relay the floor then you know that is a good defense yeah and maybe it won't completely knock the claim to touch but, but it could you know it might well substantially reduce the uh, final damages okay so here we have a an example and hopefully I can illustrate the points that I've made with this example so here is a, an example and you'll see that in this case it's a boiler issue this is based on an actual case that we ran here or rather we assisted a litigant in person to run themselves and it's very simple just have a look there's the particulars of claim you would fit this into if you were a claimant this, this, this would fit into the box in the claim form probably so you wouldn't need separate pleadings uh, we then go on to the defense itself I've just put in bold there things that I think are, are relevant this is the case of where you're requiring the claimant to prove it's not an issue that it wasn't a new Titan boiler but uh, it might be something that, you know, because this is why you should really, you know, think carefully about the allegations that are being made. It may be that in this case, that it, was a, it was a second-hand Titan bullet, or it wasn't a Titan bullet, it was a new something else. Um, you don't have any reason to suspect it wasn't, but since the issue in this claim is the boiler leaked, you might want to put the claim to proof that the boiler that they say was fitted was the exact self-same specification. And there you go, you admit things, and uh, there you have the, the section paragraph 5, you know, don't be silly, if, if, if things are agreed and admitted, if the facts are that a new time and valve was needed, well, uh, just simply admit it, don't try and create extra uh, complications, you don't have to defend everything, you are allowed to admit things, yeah? And the importance of admitting things is it then helps you to focus on your case and what it is that you really deny. And this is, in paragraph six, you know, I've used the word agree. You don't have to use the words admit, deny, um, put to proof. You, you just agree is, is fine. Yeah? Don't get hung up on the legalese here. So I've also got an example there of the pre-action conduct uh, paragraph that I was talking about earlier. If you think pre-action conduct is relevant, certainly if the claimant has raised it, then beef up your own pre-action conduct paragraph and not their uh, pre-action paragraph in the touch by giving yours a little bit of heading and saying a little bit more. And then of course you've got the statement of truth which you need to sign. So uh, there it is. I, I will just put up a, another uh, defence, which is one where we assisted a litigant in person. This is quite an interesting case. A few of these have come, at, come up actually, where estate agents are actually chasing uh, landlords for commissions where the estate agents have placed a tenant in a property that the landlord owns. And they've got these, un, these what's the word, unending, unlimited commission clauses, like however many tenants you get in the property, you're going to get stung with this commission until the end, until you die, which seems a very, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, aggressive and punitive type of clause for an estate agent to put in the contract. So our client didn't like this, uh, the claim was brought by the estate agent against our client, and we helped, we actually discovered that the terms and conditions of the estate agent were pretty woolly, hadn't been very well drafted and gave us a nice legal loophole to exploit um, and we also helped the defendant our client marshal the evidence and actually refer to the relevant sections of the Bible the civil procedure rules in order to create a nice tight defense 
we didn't draft this, yeah, you, you don't need to get a solicitor to draft your defence. If you're an intelligent person, you just get the solicitor to give you the general advice, which we gave to him in an email. It was only a one or two hour, couple of hours' work, I think. And subsequently, the claim was struck out. So that is a claim that, uh, that our clients won. And that just, you know, so the, the point is that you can, you can do it too. Okay, so I'll just finally wrap up by saying uh, it really is important to keep your statement of case, whether you're the claimant or the defendant, concise and address each and every allegation and don't uh, leave anything out or as dangerous it may be assumed you admit it. Okay? Uh, don't confuse drafting statements of case with witness statements and evidence. Don't include documentation. A reference there to an invoice. Don't include the invoice here. Yeah? This is just the skeleton that helps the judge understand the facts of, of the defence and helps him you know, tease out the issues. That is what it's for. Why shouldn't you write a novel length defence? I mean, you might be saying to me, oh, I might as well just throw in the kitchen sink because I'm not really sure about what I should say and what I shouldn't say, so I'll say absolutely everything. I think that the problem with that is, I mean, it could get you off on the wrong foot. You know, judges are human beings, and if they come into a hearing and the paperwork is a bit of a mess, then they just kind of shifts them that little bit over onto the side of your opponent. So don't be the person who's slightly on the back foot when it comes to a hearing or to the final trial. I think the other thing that is critical is that if you put the kitchen sink in, you lose your, the key points. And there's a danger that the court won't see the wood from the trees. And I think that's what the statement of the case is really all about. It's helping to really drill in to what the issues are, what the allegations are, what the, what the, claim, the claim is. And, you know, your best points, and there may only be five of them, may be lost in a sea of verbosity. So that's another good reason for, for actually um, being really, really... Uh, concise and it will actually help you I mean you're you've got ownership in this case one of the biggest problems that litigants in person have that lawyers have is we get too close to our case we don't actually see what the issues are by sitting down and applying that razor-sharp thinking to the allegations you'll think you'll realize that a lot you've got a lot of baggage a lot of emotional baggage around irrelevant parts of your case better to lead with your best points and not to get caught up, you know, in two pages of waffle about something that really is entirely incidental. Okay, I, I, I did say that I would show you the difference between a small short form defence which can fit into the box on the claim form and a longer form. I mean, this is one <coughs> in a case, this is a cohabitation property dispute, you know, £100,000 value, a uh, couple arguing over who was going to get the property or whether or not our client, the lady, was going to get a share of the property. Uh, we won this case, I'll, I'm happy to report. But even though I thought we had a reasonably strong case, um, it didn't stop the, the man in this instance producing a very long and comprehensive defence. And that's drafted by a barrister. And you can see, I mean, it goes on till it's about 11 pages, 10 pages. Um, it was also uh, a, a counterclaim, and uh, as you can see, but uh, I will, won't deal with counterclaims because of the time it will take me to, to address them. I'll deal with counterclaims in a, another vlog. So, you know, if your claim is complex, if it is high value, then you may well want to draft a full set of uh, particulars, a, a full statement of case, not particulars, sorry, a full defence and counterclaim. It can be used quite effectively tactically. If you're, I often see particulars of claim that are very hurriedly knocked off by claimants. You know, they want to get uh, out of the starting blocks, they want to get the claim issued, and they, you can see they, they, they're actually uh, in danger of getting into tricky waters because they are, their claim form is, is pretty poorly uh, structured 
perhaps just simply very lightweight, you could then make a tackle, tactical decision to not just fill in the box like I've just shown you earlier, but to produce your own full set of uh, pleadings, your own you know, official looking defence and can claim if, if you need to. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's worth giving a little bit of thought to whether or not you want to go short or long. If it is a complex claim, and I have to say, I'm a lawyer, I would say this, but you know, you, you may well want to get a lawyer involved in a complex cavitation property dispute like that, believe me. Uh, now, just finally, if you want to contact us, if you want some advice and assistance from Rebel Legal, then I urge you, you're litigant in person, it's a small claim or a fast track claim, I urge you to email us and attach uh, key documents. Attach more rather than less, we know how to speed read documents. Create a couple of paragraphs telling us the story of your claim and the, the, the claim value, it's very important we know the value of the claim because we often price according to the value to keep legal costs proportionate. We'll then quote you. Yeah, we'll then look at, it, at that email and we'll quote you what we think it will cost us to give you some preliminary advice to help you to draft your own defence, yeah? Key things that we think you need to, need to include. That, you know, as often as not, could be all that you need from the lawyers. If it's a more complicated set of pleadings, then you may want us to quote you to draft it on your behalf. You still conduct the litigation yourself, but we'll draft the pleadings for you. So you can go away and use them. That obviously can be a little bit more expensive. I mean, it, last one did that it was last month. It was five hours of work. So that was seven hundred and fifty quid plus fare. So I hope that has been useful. And as I say, I will uh, produce a vlog on how to deal with a counterclaim uh, um, when I can get when I can get some when I can get some time because uh, a little bit pressed for time at the moment. There was one final thing that I wanted to just mention to you. Yeah, and, and that is if you just want to phone a lawyer and talk generally about your case, that's fine. I mean, I don't mind talking to someone, we don't mind talking to someone who's got litigation assistance here as well for five minutes on the phone. Yeah, uh, but the discounted £150 service, you know, it, we do need to uh, charge you. And it's not like a big case where we might get a lot more work down the, down the line. We do need to be quite strict about how we charge things in order to run a business. Uh, sometimes you, you may want just to talk over the phone to a, to a, to a lawyer. That's fine too. We just charge you 150 plus that for uh, an hour on the phone with lawyers. Sometimes that's all you need. Okay, I hope that's been useful. Uh, please don't hesitate to press the subscribe button as it, will, as it gets us up the Google rankings or the YouTube rankings. And look forward to vlogging you, vlogging to you in the near future. Bye for now.